The views and opinions expressed in this video are those of the speakers and panelists and do not necessarily reflect the position of the Ethos Institute for Public Christianity and its founding institutions and organizations. Is Jesus God? Migrant workers and human rights from a Christian perspective. Marriage and family. ISIS presents a much bigger threat. How do we integrate the Bible with our scientific understanding? Are you able to actually describe and articulate clearly your own sense of purpose in life? And 
uh, contrary to what sometimes we, we think, it's not a lot. It's more than the absence of mental disorders. I think this part is very important to really highlight because we also often when we're talking about mental health, the conversation will center upon uh, mental uh, health concerns, mental illnesses. But actually, mental health is something which is relevant to everybody. Just like physical health is important to all of us, so is mental health. Even by WHO's uh, own reckoning, it is a complex continuum. So it is best illustrated by a nice diagram. On this diagram, we have people on the healthy, and then on the left side, left hand side, and then ranging as a spectrum of those you consider to be unwell. Okay. And also, people are coping, some are struggling, and then they become unwell. And then, uh, how do you fit in mental wellness and mental illness into this schematic? I suppose you can consider the, on this left hand side, people. Be having more mental wellness, and on the right hand side, this way I guess it crosses over to what we call mental illness. Now, tonight we're going to use the term mental illness, and the focus tonight is, I think, a lot of the will be on mental illness. Other terms we use for psychiatric conditions, psychiatric disorders, mental health conditions. I think in my field of practice, we use a lot of terms because sometimes maybe there's a lot of stigma to some terms, but uh, mental illness is, a, is, is the correct term to use. I mean, all of them are correct, but that's what we're going to be using tonight. And so, the question I, I guess I'll Probably many people do have about uh, mental illnesses. No, since there's a spectrum, right? You can see the healthy to unwell. There's really a spectrum here. So, actually, when does it actually cross over into a mental illness? Because, I mean, like for example, let me give you an example as anxiety. Everyone gets worried about things, right? So, you know, when is it anxiety disorder or depression? Right? So, so, I think we, these are valid questions, and even for people working in this field, sometimes we, are, we wrestle among ourselves as to what actually constitutes a mental illness. So um, one of the ways of uh, identifying what constitutes a mental illness is to give some operational sort of like a, like a definition, some sort of uh, criteria. And uh, I'd like to use this uh, five terms, distress, dysfunction, deviation, persistence, and pervasiveness to illustrate when, when symptoms might actually go over and do what we call mental illness. Okay? So, by, uh, by using these uh, five, uh, you know, uh, five sort of considerations, then we can actually see how symptoms can actually cross over into something called mental illness. Okay, of course, I'm not going to leave you here hanging and then what's this about, right? Okay, so, first of all, so I'm going to illustrate that. So, for example, for, uh, for this uh, depression, okay? Uh, in depression, I think all of us go through sadness. I think you and I, uh, we've gone through our periods of sadness in life. But uh, for the person who's gone through major depression or, or any mood disorder, that degree of sadness is both in terms of duration, both in terms of uh, uh, the depth of it is really uh, is something altogether different. So yeah, we we'll say there's a lot of distress. So the, it's really well again the distress is caused by that associated with that kind of um, uh, depth, uh, low depth. And uh, yeah, in the sense you can see it is the psychic equivalent of pain. Okay, how about persistence? Okay, so for people who have a generalized anxiety disorder, the worries they have are not like, I guess you can say most, of, most people in the population would definitely have worries from time to time, but some of the patients I treat with a generalized anxiety disorder is really crippling, disabling, day to day, waking every waking hour is just filled with all kinds of uh, worries, so we actually call that generalized anxiety disorder. And things are uh, dysfunction. Okay, so, for example, so, uh, for people with schizophrenia, they, the level of dysfunction that's caused by schizophrenia, if not treated, can really affect you know, many areas of their life. From school, I've, I've known people who are top students in school, and because they had the onset of schizophrenia, was not given the treatment needed, subsequently they were unable to even hold on a job in the years ahead. So, yeah, so it can be very, very disabling. And we use the word dysfunction, not meant to be uh, pejorative or any reason to just to describe um, factually that this caused a lot of pain and, and, and uh, uh, affected the function. Okay, uh, next up, pervasiveness. So pervasiveness is this idea that the, when the condition or when the situation affects multiple domains of life. And so, so someone who has autism spectrum disorder, uh, their, their symptoms, you can, you can really say that it crosses over to yeah, really every domain of their life, from the day-to-day -day functioning, to their social relationships, to the way they learn, to the way they work, to the way they interpret all sorts of events happening around them. 
So this meant uh, we call that pervasive, you know, that the, the condition doesn't just affect one area of life, but affects many, many different domains. And finally, for deviation, yeah, um, so I'll give a personality disorder as a, as a, as a, as a example. What we're trying to say is that uh, someone who sometimes has uh, differ from others in very extreme ways, uh, in certain traits, uh, and now when, that, now when that happens, it causes them a lot of impairment in their day to day functioning with other people, and sometimes it causes a lot of distress for other people around them, and then we can also say that they are actually having a lot of deviation from what we call general norms of uh, society. Yes, as, even as I speak about all these uh, uh, conditions and how we, how, we, how we define them, you can see there's a this quite complex area. So, but just uh, allow me to use this to just to like, uh, explain a bit on the, when mental health symptoms when they cross over to mental illness. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, how common and what possible causes of mental illness. Okay, so uh, this is a well known. Uh, Sorry. Okay, so this is uh, the incidence in Singapore. The SMP, SMHS stands for the Singapore Mental Health Study. So the one, the first one was done in 2010 and the second one was done in 2016. Okay, so you can see that uh, from just six years apart, and it was a very robust study involving like, you know, uh, large numbers of people in Singapore, they more than almost close to 10,000. Okay, so you can see that the numbers all jumped for every category of condition. Okay. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of this written up about the Singapore Mental Health Study. So if you're very interested in this, just Google it and you'll find this a lot. Uh, my colleagues at IMH and other research institutions in Singapore have done a lot of uh, interpretation of the data. But the salient thing I want to emphasize is that based on these two studies, you can see that any of the urban mental health disorders from 12% in 2010 to jump to around almost 14% in 2016. And that's why we're saying one out of seven people in their lifetime is going to have a mental health or mental illness. Okay. Uh, now, that's in the general population. I think the big question here tonight is, what about the church? Okay, so, uh, if you go back to your own home churches, if you look around, yeah, there's uh, all around you, there'll be, well, if there's someone in front of you, someone behind you, left and right, and all the diagonals, that means that one person around you is going to have mental health issues or mental illness. So it is that it is actually that um, uh, serious. Okay, so uh, it is a statistic we look at. Um, of course, with alarm, but at the same time we also look at it. Hopefully, with compassion and put our heads together to see what we can do to reach out to the needs of this com those who suffer from such conditions. Okay, so some uh, another good source of uh, data is uh, not just uh, formal studies, but I guess our mainstream media. Okay, so in recent times. I think in the past few years, almost every other week, uh, almost every week, there'll be a few articles on mental health, but these are more recent ones. Okay, so I, just, I don't think I need to dwell too much in the details, but essentially, it will be in a pandemic, but now due to work changes in the pandemic, youth mental health crisis, and then changes in employment, change in uh, inflation, this is not really speaking a lot about inflation. I think all these are, in a sense, contributing to, of course, the mental health uh, uh, crisis that some people have described. Okay, and uh, it's sadly, of course, the ultimate, um, the ultimate what we call uh, avoidable outcome, or the, the outcome we hope to prevent with all the efforts that we put in is suicide. Because a lot of times, mental illness, if it's not treated, if it's uh, or mismanaged, a lot of times we are fearful that we actually cause lead to suicide. And unfortunately, the numbers I mean, uh, have shown a rise. And on the left hand side, you see that uh, after 2021, uh, they really go up to peak in 2020 and then they come down. Okay, so that was a very reassuring, at least on the face of it. But actually, if we look further into the data, we find that actually for the youth population, it's been, actually been steadily climbing. And uh, anecdotally, we're speaking to people who are in the schools and working with youth. I don't think the problem is one that's going to go away is, um, so soon. It so, does require a lot of effort on our, the part of our churches, our community, various organizations to see what to do to help them. Okay. Uh, below all the suicides, sometimes people may not have sought help. But based on studies, we do know that actually many people do have underlying mental illness. It's just that they've not sought help for it. So I think uh, even though they may not be formally diagnosed, the fact that, you know, that many of them actually have undiagnosed mental illness is a cause for concern. What can we do as a society, as a church, to help people to get the help they need? So I'd like to work about 
document causes of mental illness. Okay, so uh, in medicine, the practice of healthcare and, and medicine, we often talk about this biopsychosocial model. It is a popular model and very easy to understand. You know, doctors like me are not like theologians. We think very simply. <laughs> we have very simple schematics of our life. So my life, since I was a medical student, biological, psychological and social. It's true. <laughs> okay, right, so, so what are these biological, psychological and social factors that we contribute to mental illness? Okay, so for biological, okay, this is just a listing. I mean, just for you, maybe just, most of you, when you think biological, you think about genetics. And genetics is a common one where you say that your family has this history of some uh, illness. But actually, there are many things that contribute to physical illness. Recent years, inflammation is a big thing that's been researched. Uh, drugs refer to not just both the prescription drugs that people use, as well as uh, drugs of abuse. Or, and even the ordinary caffeine that you consume, or some people smoke, the, you know, these are all actually considered to be substances or drugs. And of course, lifestyle issues, uh, right? I think our uh, common modern day world, <coughs> sleep is something that is taken off, no? it's uh, taken for granted, and sometimes it's, uh, we sleep as little as we can. Okay, how about psychological factors? So, resilience, okay, so this is all listed here. I think the important thing, what, what we mean by psychological factors are things which are internal to our mind or our psyche. So how we think about the world around us, how we um, perceive things around us. Um, and also, for example, if we go through trauma in our life, then certainly that would make, make you do, or make me do it somehow more suspicious of people, you know, more to the intentions, maybe easily distrusting. Or for example, if some people have negative thought patterns, it may be that because one time they had a very major catastrophe in their life, so subsequently in many other things in their life they tend to catastrophize. So that's what we call a negative thought pattern. Okay. And finally, uh, the social factors, so it really spans a lot of age areas, right? Secure attachments, family, friendships, everything. So as opposed to psychological factors, social factors refer to really you interacting with the world around yourself. That's why I think we know that's very important because uh, uh, this, when, when everything's all healthy, I mean you have all this, but when things like divorce happens, when there's loss, when there's grief and all that, of course then they will of course interfere with all these um, areas of our social functioning. Okay, so uh, all in all we call this the biopsychosocial model. I think then it really begs the question, right? Where does the church come into all this? Or where does you know, spirituality, where does faith come to all this? So when I was in medical school, this was a model that was taught to me and back then, while well, I was a Christian then, um, I, I can't say I really thought too hard into it. See, doctors don't think too hard. <laughs> yeah, so, I didn't think too hard into the spiritual implications of just accepting a model or wholesale like this. Okay, but clearly it is, uh, if, you know, if, we, um, if we want to think that our faith does really involve the whole of our lives, everything, you know, that, that God's truth is evident everywhere, then it can't be there's no role for in the sense of our faith or our spirituality within this. Okay, so this is where we can conceptualize that overlapping with the biological, the psychological, and the social. There's also this spiritual dimension. Okay, so uh, I, I know that I think of my chemistry models in, uh, in uh, something like that, right? <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so uh, so I think there is a um, it's important to recognize that yeah, there is a spiritual component to health and to mental health in particular as we talk about this topic tonight. Okay, so I think that will then plus uh, lead us to you know, ask more like. How do, what do we do about this, uh, uh, what do we mean by causes, or spiritual causes, it just sounds like iffy, right? No, 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 I mean, you say like, some, is it just about like, um, a demon? No, I think the most common thing which I think uh, I would better not steal would be thunder. I mean, one of the common things is about <laughs> mental health is about demonization, right? right? Is it, so, so, of course, that's an important topic, and, yeah, but uh, I think beyond that, I think there are spiritual factors that operate uh, in mental illness. Okay? We should please talk about the spiritual aspects. Okay, so first of all, let me talk about the contributing factors. And again, uh, being lazy or I think or being forgetful, I've tried to summarize into three S's. This is we're talking about spiritual. So, so the first S that stands for sluggishness. Okay. <laughs> I don't know whether it's correct. Uh, so so maybe uh, pardon me if it's uh, maybe a bit too harsh or too. Uh, no, it's not meant to be condemning, but it refers to myself. Cause what I remember sluggishness prayer. Okay. Bible reading, fellowship, and of course, Sabbath rest. So I think um, by this category, what I mean is that sometimes, as, as, as believers, I mean, we do have, uh, we are of course exhorted to have uh, lean our lives and uh, to go to, you know, um, as we you know, uh, turn more to the 
image of a uh, role model like Christ. I think we are, of course, uh, these are the dimensions of our lives that you know, we, we try our best to, to, uh, to uh, carry out. Of course, life catches up with us, business catches up with us, the worries of the world choke us up, choke our faith, and then these things come in, right? Prayerlessness, um, you know, I mean, like missing out quiet times, and fellowship during pandemic, I think one of the big things was you know, we couldn't meet together. And then after the pandemic win, churches were trying their best to get people to come back to to come to face to face uh, fellowship, right? And it has been tough for some churches, I believe. And so the science has a joy that we will see all of you here tonight, because it's not easy, right? Because we've gotten used to Zoom meetings and Zoom the Zoom source seminars. And then raise Sabbath rest, okay? So I know that not many people probably practice of true Sabbath, a full, a full Sabbath, but just at least the idea of a proper rest, you know, in our this day and age of like having this monster in our pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I think rest is a very hard thing. I think really, even though you can mute it or whatever, but the temptation to be just, you know, so we need to think of ways to detox better. Okay, but this is so really just our slug, sluggishness, I mean, and they can contribute to mental health issues, you know, really, because, uh, I mean, in a sense, the, we are asked to you know, really guard our minds and all that, right? So if our minds are filled with the wrong things, I mean, with all the social media nonsense and all that, all like, it's always restless thinking about our work. Naturally, of course, it will also affect our well-being, okay? okay. Uh, so since the second S, sinful thoughts and behavior, so I, I think by this I'm referring to probably more, uh, so I guess you can think of this as omission. This is more com commission and things that you may be like, uh, uh, that we may be prone to, you know, to, to, to indulge in all that, right? So, so it could be unforgiveness, right? So I think uh, in, uh, we live in a society where personal rights is a big thing. So I do talk to many patients and it, you know, it grieves me sometimes to hear how some people are really unwilling to let go. So much has happened to them, but they cannot let, they cannot, they cannot allow for opportunity that things can be let go of. Yeah. Covetousness, of course, and we live in a society where Lazada, Shopee, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's more and more and more, uh, it's crazy. Uh, I, 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 on one hand, I know sometimes I need to buy stuff there because it's the best team, but when I go on there, I really hate it because it's just so distracting. And, it's, uh, and it, what it's doing for our minds and our souls, I don't know. We, <laughs> we have to ask, look at what to okay, about that. Yeah. Not, to, not to mention the wallet. Okay. Okay, there are also a promiscuity. Yeah. We live in a world whereby um, I mean, sex has been, uh, has been commodified, and it's, it's, it's scary you know, that to think about how. Well, it was once used to be something very when people guarded carefully nowadays. I mean, I mean sometimes it's reduced to just a very transactional sort of a relationship between people. Okay, so I mean, it's just some examples. There are many, many more sins, right? And of course, finally, of course, then this where the part about satanic influence. And I was careful to not talk about satanic possession because actually, if I understand correctly, possession itself is really quite a relatively rare phenomenon. But what much more common, much more common is demonic influence in our lives, right? Because I think, I mean, I mean, Satan is, a, is a prowling, like a, still prowling around, right? And so I think he will take the opportunity to, of course, look for ways to stop all believers and all that. So, so I think that's where I mean by Satanic influence, okay? They don't ask me a bit more questions. <laughs> right, okay. So the second thing I want to delve into this part, which I guess uh, a bit more, uh, hopefully can uh, share a bit more light about uh, how spiritual, spiritual issues can uh, can overlap with uh, mental health conditions or mental illness. Okay. Okay. So we think about hopelessness, right? So, uh, but this uh, um, for hopelessness, right? Uh, what happens is that in major depressive disorder, one of the criteria for major depressive disorder is actually called uh, hopelessness. You know, that's this sense of like you feel there's like no hope in your life. So yeah, then if you think about it, but you know the, the Bible tells us that you know that you know, we only have our hope, you know, our living hope is with us really, you know, that's come really. So so it can be really hard you know, for people, Christians who are going through depression, sometimes they're really wrestling with you know, guilt. You know, they're also really wrestling with guilt, like you no, know, like how can I how can I not feel hopeful when the Bible tells me I like, really my my hope and all that? It's just very painful and that's what, I mean I, I mean it really that would require as much more time to talk about, but just maybe just take this as a this is uh, just as an introduction to the idea. Okay, then of course for anxiety and worry, I mean, if you have a, for all like, my patients who have a generalized anxiety disorder, I think they will attend, they will, if they sometimes go to church and all that, they will hear all the exhortations that do not worry about anything, right? So cast all your cares upon you, of course, he cares upon you. And these are deep, very, very, these Bible verses, they come from scripture, they are right, and it's 
So we are not we are not saying that the, the scripture is always correct, but sometimes I mean you know, because of the you know, fallenness, you know, you know, that I think we have people usually wrestle with various sorts of mental illness, and sometimes it causes them to have really inordinate amount of worry, which is really pathological. So uh, so uh, we have to I mean for me I need to just try to distinguish help people distinguish what is normal worry that perhaps the scripture can be something that can encourage them to surrender those worries to God and what is pathological whereby it does require some kind of treatment. Okay, uh, this is uh, I think uh, and um, Bernice has not introduced me as uh, and said that also here is one of my pet uh, interest in uh, psychiatry and it is, it, it is indeed uh, the case. Yeah, because OCD is quite interesting condition uh, and there's some training in the area and also in Singapore it happens to be that Singapore has been described as the OCD capital because <laughs> it is really true. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you know and because you know, when you come from a society whereby we obviously the three keys, right? Kiasu, Kiasi, Kiasu, also the one. But it's so essentially we live our lives with a lot of like fear of um, making sure that things are correct, making sure things are clean, making sure things are done properly, sweet, sweet, right? Right? I mean, that's also in a sense in Singapore we have very low tolerance for things going wrong. So when, when you have done that, I mean, it's more complex than that, but in general, I mean, the influence of that I think has shaped people such that. They do have a, they are much more prone towards developing a, a high level of fastidiousness, a high level of uh, exact, exacting standards and all that in life. And they can then spill over to what we call for, for someone who has OCD, they can develop scrupulosity. Scrupulosity refers to this concept whereby people who are religious, they carry out their practices in a way that is uh, almost uh, fanatical. And so that they can like, uh, and they never feel that they've done enough. So they, uh, for example, there's a prayer, they might have to repeat the prayer, repeat the ritual the whole day just to make themselves feel better. Or it could be, for example, uh, in outside of the Protestant Christianity, for example, the idea of penance and all that. You know, penance has been something Catholic churches has been a quite a big thing historically in terms of a way of uh, of uh, uh, helping you to absolve your uh, to to remove part of your death, guilt of sin and all that. And of course, it applies to other of religious systems and all that. But in for Christians. This idea of scrupulosity is a very heavy burden because what happens is that when it's being done, like you'll be seen as actually, at least at the early stages, oftentimes you might be thought of as someone who's quite, oh, you're quite a, you know, quite a fervent believer. You know, it's good that you're really always willing to confess that you are not a prayerful. And these are the things we want to encourage as a church, right? The willingness to confess sin, the willingness to turn to God in prayer. But I have really come across believers who. It's become actually compulsive in nature, whereby it no longer is an ordinary conversation with God, but it is their way of really just making themselves feel better. So they just do it repeatedly, and sometimes some of these people are meant and they're really tortured by their own uh, practices. They can pray, and sometimes because they forgot a certain way of uh, saying certain things in a certain order, they had to restart from the very beginning. Then, since then, they meet somebody who was from the church, and then and it's very hard for people to understand. Because it does sound like a good thing to be prayerful and all that. So just I mean so it is a complicated area, but yeah, just to highlight that. Okay, okay, there's so the usual are hyper religiosity. So what that means is that some people, as part of their mental health issue or mental illness, is that they actually are very they they on the surface they look like someone who's really on fire, right? They are the people with all kinds of a, basically the their whole concept of uh, I guess life is really uh, focused upon the you know, the influence of uh, um, as it's centered upon the spirituality. And I think that's right, I mean, we should be spiritual people. But I think uh, what happens is sometimes some of these patients I've met before, um, everything they talk about is most completely everything talks about has is about God, it's about um and I I mean, talk about this it's very really hard to tease out. <laughs> yeah, life should be about God, but that is it's the way whereby every single thing they have to bring in has a religious flavor to it and has a certain meaning and has a, and they have a certain mission to play and all that. So yeah, so it is again in this early stages you don't probe deep enough, it just you can be very encouraged because this is someone so on fire and all that. But some of these people I've met subsequently I see them in an outpatient clinic and wow you know, it's really so so happy to see that, you know, that they are that they are such a leading such a close, walking so closely with God. But uh, sadly also that sometimes a few weeks later I come across people being admitted to the hospital, the very same hospital because they got into a full relapse of their schizophrenia or something. And so what happens then we've identified that this kind of uh, um, sometimes some of the 
symptoms they've been describing or some of the experiences that they've been describing. As it progresses, it can become delusional, they may believe they have a special mission, they believe they have a special role. And, and I have come across people who overtly have actually identified themselves as becoming messianic in nature. But far further, but not so, not so frequently. Yeah. Yeah, so it does require a lot of time spent right, to really sort to suss out what's the whether where whether is that a delusion or is that a faith thing. So addictions, I think I won't draw too much into that. I think we know that addictions is a is a big struggle because there's people who or we know that we think of it as a sin and of course there's a component of it that is uh, you know, oftentimes is a predilection to going back to things that are bad for us. But yet at the same time we also you know, understand that from a biological level that people who are do have a, a propensity towards using certain substances or going back to certain behaviors. So there seems to be some biological um, uh, predilection for that. Okay, sexuality, of course, we know that we live in a world whereby this is the contemporary, I mean, um, it attracts a lot of attention on the, over the issues about the sexual orientation, on the trans, uh, transgender issues, and all that. And, and of course, this is something which the church that rightfully should be concerned about and all that. But not easy, I think there's no easy answers and all that because we want to help and then the, the, the posture which we're coming from is really to help but we also up against a lot of different sort of views from the wider society and I think we of course want to be loving but at the same time also uh, be able to maintain the inerrancy and the truth of scripture. Suicide and salvation, you know, sometimes there have been people in the church you know, historically who have said that suicide is a sin, that if you someone dies by suicide that's it. I mean, there's no salvation for them. And of course, and you can say that, no, uh, but the person really has died already. I mean, you can be careless about it, so it doesn't, it's a good point, right? But imagine the loved ones were left behind and that they're, you know, they're sort of like surrounded by all sorts of this like condemnation. You know, the, the, the loved one has got to, has, has, uh, has died by suicide, and now you know, there's no possibility of salvation. And that's happened before, actually. I mean, there's this in the at times that many people have propounded this kind of. Uh, Beliefs, okay, okay, okay. Um, and so we do believe in the world whereby actually what we call neurodiversity is increasing. People with uh, neurodiversity refers to conditions such as uh, autism spectrum disorders or ADHD, attention deficit disorders, and um, they do have special needs. And and, uh, and how do we as a church see them within our congregation? How do we uh, cater to their dif differing sort of needs and all that? Well, I would be a better person to talk about this <laughs> in your room. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so I think he's going to touch on this later. So, okay. And I think finally, I think I must, uh, my last, last point I must be about the unique clinical presentations is our pastors or maybe theologians or missionaries, people who are you know, paid, uh, you know, full time Christian workers, full time in the sense that they're paid as a, in the role as a Christian worker. I think that the burden they face is, is really very unique because oftentimes people can't understand that they are not superhumans, right? <laughs> Yeah, ordinary humans also have faced all sorts of flesh and blood struggles. But to the lay member of the congregation, we look at our pastor and hey, you can do no wrong. No. So, um, so, so I think, yeah, so I'm sure one of these days I have a chance to sit down with uh, those of you here and hear those, your stories and all that about the expectations placed upon you. Okay, so but I think this is a topic that really as a church we need to look into how our people who are um, working in ministry and all that, no? how can they be better? Okay, so with that, uh, let me quickly go to the treatment approaches. Okay, so as I'm using the biological, psychological, social model, biopsychosocial. So in biological, I can cover really a lot of things. Typically, the most common thing you hear is medicines, right? I'm a psychiatrist, so uh, medicines must be the number one thing. But actually, no, many things actually involve the biology of a person who has a mental illness of all these areas of uh, neurostimulation. Is, uh, I won't go too much, I won't go into it, but it's really useful. A special technique that thinks of electrocompulsive therapy or magnetic, uh, transcranial magnetic, magnetic therapy. Essentially, these are ways of stimulating the brain cells to, to regenerate or to, uh, to be able to um, function better. Psychological, I think you're probably familiar with things like counseling, psychotherapies, and of course, in this day and age, we have chatbots. And chat, chat GPT, some people say it's quite good for counseling, so you have to give it a try. And then they, if it works, then, then some of my colleagues will be losing their jobs soon, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we hope it will help, but not work so well. Right? But okay, for okay, then for social, okay, social will refer to repairing all your or strengthening all your social relationships. So therapy, such as marital family therapy, and looking at all these areas of life. Also, uh, one thing I like about my job as a psychiatrist 
they try holistic so I get to talk to my patients about all sorts of things for their life, including pets. So uh, Pastor and I were just having a, uh, a conversation about this, uh, how, how animals are so good for our mental health and all that. And I, I as a, when this is introduced, I uh, keep fish down, I have a cat and I can testify personally that I think it's helped me to relax and all that when I come back. So I'm grateful for that. Okay. Yeah, so the other I mentioned those online groups, a lot of, uh, especially for both, both older people, but I think especially for the young, actually a lot of their friendships are online and it's hard for us to fathom. But, so some of you here who are younger, I feel like we're like an old uncle and all that, but essentially yeah, it's hard for me to fathom. But really sometimes the, most of the friends are online on Discord, on all sorts of uh, uh, Instagram and that is hard to understand. Yeah, I have people who are closest friends are people they never met before, but people they met online. So of course, the people also who I guess get attached online too. So this is a very new thing for me. Right? This whole idea. So where, but the level, I don't want to talk about the biopsychosocial model. So if we can talk about cause that there are spiritual causes, then how about spiritual side? Is there a treatment for the spiritual side? Okay, so that's where I quickly talk about what can the church do before uh, handing the time over to so there was a survey done by uh, this group called the Christian Mental Health Advocates in 2020 in Singapore. And this is the Singapore one where they surveyed, I think, 400 over Christians and pastors and church leaders. And so importantly, um, this, first of all, there's a good proportion of people in the churches who agree that mental health conditions do have a spiritual dimension to them. So that's important, right? And it's not something that just you can live alone. The, the church must be involved. Mental health disorders may require medical treatment. It was very good to see that 60% agree. But what's worrying is that there is a good minority who are a bit iffy about it. Okay? And this can affect the outcomes for people who are suffering. In terms of my church needing to do more to address mental health issues, yeah, so actually 80 over percent actually think that the churches need to do more. So uh, this was back in 2020. I think since then the main uh, needle may have moved a little bit, but yeah, but there's still a lot of work to do uh, for us in the church. So today we're talking about this topic is very uh, timely. And then has the church sufficiently equipped you? Uh, unfortunately, the majority don't think so. Okay, so again, there's a lot for the church to do. Okay, uh, interestingly, there was an IMH study done uh, back uh, two years ago, whereby actually looking at the same Singapore mental health study, they did some sub-analysis, and they found that people with a religious affiliation actually do better in their mental health. And particularly for Christians, interestingly, Christians enjoy significantly higher emotional support compared to those with no religion. Uh, and then in the analysis, this they uh, was in saw a line also, so, uh, so but they essentially highlights the importance of being plugged into and involved in the local church community. So I think uh, I mean both in uh, our experience in church as well as actually research does actually just uh, confirm the idea uh, that actually mental health I mean, is something that the churches do need to. Be, uh, play a very big part in you know, that as part of looking after the flock and the congregation. Right? Okay, so, briefly, what can the church do? So, I'm speaking from my perspective, uh, so uh, in the sense of having seen patients, of, having, of being a member of the church. I'd love to hear later on about the from theological perspective, too. Okay, so, okay, okay, so first of all, the pulpit. I think three P's again, so I think I was uh, usually morning. So, three P's, so pulpit. So, I think really, given a chance, I think, of course. Hopefully, pastors who are speaking in the public can use that as a chance to be able to, not to inject that into every message, but where appropriate to be able to assure people that mental health is something that can be destigmatized and to encourage people to seek help. Pastoral care and prayer, so I think this is where I've been just really looking after the wide variety of the spiritual needs and praying for them uh, in, a, in an informed way. Lah. So, pray, not, not just to just inject scripture and then thinking scripture will do the trick of healing somebody, but to understand a bit better on the underlying mental health condition. And finally, practical support. So this can be financial, this could be for example childcare, for maybe helping with the childcare arrangements for someone who's a, a mother who's going through depression and all that, right? And so I think these are the three 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 parts that I can think of that a church can do. But it doesn't just happen overnight, this requires some kind of preparation, right? So the fourth P. So we need to prepare people and I think we need to equip. So that can be the pastors, the leaders, the members. Or caregivers, so people who have other uh, loved ones or mental, those with mental health concerns, I think they also need to be equipped. And there are many organizations in Singapore who work in the area, so we also can partner with them. And finally, also for people, mental health professionals. So, like, um, I mean, in Singapore, I think all in all, we have probably at least 2,000 2, mental health professionals, counselors, psychologists, 
um, a smaller number of psychiatrists, but in terms of psychologists, at least probably about six, seven hundred, counselors probably more than one thousand. So I think many of them are actually believers, but many of them don't really know how to integrate their faith into their practices. So, so I think this is an area that we can look out for and how to better equip them to feel comfortable about talking about such issues. Because a lot of times when we study in our professionally, the professional inputs we get are very secularized, there's no, oftentimes there's not a lot of room for faith. Okay, so I just, uh, I'm going to finish off with a case example and I should hand over because time is running. Okay, so the case example is, uh, this is a 30 year old uh, uh, patient of mine. Okay. Uh, he was just referred by polyclinic for depression. Okay, and there was a suspected relapse of depression. And uh, he came from a family that were my parents were believers, but unfortunately, I mean, of course, parents are not perfect. His father was very harsh, perhaps the culture of that day. And it was very harsh and you know, basically got him to do very uh, extreme ways of trying to get him to learn things and all that. Okay, so as part of his coping with his growing up, this patient of mine had been self harm and then he has also had times in his past he felt very suicidal. Um, the depressive symptoms also surfaced then subsequently during the circuit breaker. So this is the pandemic that happened these last three years. Okay, so and he also felt very much stuck at home because every you know, we talk about this thing the cabin fever, right? Everyone's at home, the children are home 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 based learning, parents at home work more. So it's very suffocating for this patient of mine. So he actually had a suicidal plan, and but thankfully he actually had quite a serious suicidal plan, but he didn't do go ahead of it. He sought help. He's confided in a Christian brother, and then that's where he actually decided to seek professional help. So when he saw me, I think I confirmed. Uh, actually, my, my sometimes the diagnosis has come out very easy one. Right? <laughs> when you read this, also you can diagnose, right? Right. So 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 sorry. So I mean, I'm not trying to belittle uh, the condition, but it's actually I mean, it's, it's no rocket science. I mean, this is the question. Okay, it is really and this, this poor man was really suffering and with depression when he came to see me. Okay, so uh, I started antidepressants, which so that was some help for the initial part. Importantly, he saw a psychologist. The psychologist was also a Christian, so was able to appreciate that how he struggled with his faith as well as the mental illness part of it. But what he did, the Christian psychologist, they actually do a therapy, like one sort of therapy whereby it focuses on the memories, traumatic memories of his childhood. And uh, after seven or eight sessions, these memories also improved and all that. So that was very helpful. Uh, this, um, patient also, uh, he, he took it upon himself to try to, he was encouraged to find new ways to engage himself. So it was both with music, uh, doing, if you remember doing the circuit breaker, exercise is quite limited, but he managed to find a way to go out, to do some exercise, and all that a bit more regularly. So that apparently helped. So I think, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, he had been first uh, encouraged to get help from uh, someone in church. And he remained active in his church. And then the, uh, from what he told me, apparently the pastor, as well as the the, some brothers in his cell group were actually uh, aware of his condition and were actually very encouraging of him to see the psychologist, take his medicines. So that's really, I guess, ideal. I mean, so thankfully, three months later, he actually made a recovery. Of course, not a total recovery. He still struggles with some, you know, sometimes on and off low mood, but he essentially was able to function much better. Okay, and so if we use this matrix, right, and this is the story I just painted. So. Uh, the medicines help with his sleep, also helps with his mood, and then exercise. He, he, did, he took it upon himself to, to exercise regularly. He, he, he attended his psychotherapy sessions regularly, 7 or 8 or 10. And then he, he made time to meet up with his friends from the church. Uh, he developed hobbies in the exercise and all that. Of course, there's many other areas, but these are the things I wanted to highlight. So, uh, what I'm trying to show at this is that really, that, you know, that in the treatment, that does require multiple angles. Multiple domains. That of course spiritual, right? So how? Okay, so <laughs> so that uh, so that's the next part. Okay, so <laughs> I, I, I end my time with this uh, uh, quote. Okay, that's uh, from a book called Darkness is My Only Companion. Um, yeah, so it's a very good book. In case you know someone or you yourself are struggling with a mood disorder, depression, or bipolar, do pick up a copy of this book. It is a very very good book. And uh, yeah, essentially uh, this author will struggle with depression herself. Um, she encourages you know, why it's so important to worship the community, ask your brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for you and to pray with them. And so essentially, she was very much supported by this, the faith of our community around her, even in the darkest times. And, and I think that really helps me, I guess, summarize that tonight as we come together to talk about mental health in the church. We want the church to be a community to help those who are going through mental health issues and all that. And, you know, not something to hide anymore, but really to come out and to go to help. Uh, 
bit of any shame or guilt. Okay, so I'll end here. And then I think the questions will leave till later. But yeah, before that, um, uh, maybe I'll show this later during the 10-minute break. But essentially, this is our upcoming Christian Mental Health Conference. And then uh, maybe you can consider for yourself whether you're interested. And if you're looking for resources, this is an organization called mentalconnect.org. It gives you some access to some various resources, mental health resources in Singapore, including some which are Christian-based. Okay, so after that, I think we can leave this on in a 10 minutes break. And then helplines, which I think you can get off. Uh, if you need uh, to see this, you can go to the National Council of Social Services, various helplines for different situations. Okay, uh, okay so I end of time for women.